This podcast is made possible through donations from listeners like you and our partners at Tallman Equipment, where they pride themselves on equipping their customers with the tools they need to get the job done right. They are dedicated to set the standard for quality, convenience, and reliability. At Tallman, your opinion is important to them. Rate and review any product or tool you've used on their new website at tallmanequipment.com. Line 1 1 Clothing Company. Making apparel for our first responders with a positive message to patriots that you can be proud of. The proceeds of the cost goes to helping our foundation ignite the fire for father engagement. Give them a follow at Line 1 1 Clothing on Instagram. And last but not least, Monzingo Knives. Each knife is created with craftsmanship that only a tradesman could provide. Find them on Instagram at Monzingo Knives and get your American-made Monzingo knife today. Welcome to the Show Up Dad podcast. This podcast has been created for hardworking fathers. And at the podcast, we recognize that fathers providing for their children is certainly important. But when men gain the knowledge and skills to be great fathers, they can transform and impact future generations. Guest today is Matt Sinkovitz. He's been a practitioner and teacher of personal spiritual development for over a decade. He is an avid student in mindfulness and meditation. Matt comes on today talking about overcoming his 20-year compulsive relationship with porn. Matt has inspired to share his journey and support other men in the path to liberation. He has been committed to helping fathers and husbands in ending their toxic relationship with porn so they can reignite that passion in their relationships and be better role models for their children. Once again, Matt, thank you for coming on here, brother, and welcome to the show. David, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me today. Absolutely. Now, Matt, as every one of our shows, I like to always ask our guests for them to share about the relationship with your dad. Do you mind doing that? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, you know, David, uh, my relationship with my father today is good. And I would say that we're still getting to know each other. I I think generally speaking, you know, I I grew up and my dad was always present. He was always around. He was always loving. He was there for us. He showed up at the games and everything like that. Um, He he supported me in in many, many ways and he did his best. And often, often throughout my life, I felt like I didn't really know my dad. Like there was still some, some disconnect there. And, um, I think we've been working on that um, all of my life. So, so I'm, I'm really appreciative and thankful to say that today my dad is, my, my relationship with my father is good and it's getting better all the time. We're always working on the relationship. Mm-hmm. Now you talked about disconnect. Do you feel that your father suffered from that distant dad syndrome? Yeah, I think so. Maybe, man, you know, I think um, it's just, I, it's just maybe, maybe emotional presence, um, mm-hmm maybe was lacking. Maybe I didn't really feel comfortable um, really knowing my father or, or really kind of bearing who I truly was to my father and to my family. And, and, and as I kind of prefaced it all with, and I feel like I didn't really know my father fully and, and I always desired to, and I think he probably desired to know me more fully as well. And I think that's something we continue to work on. Mm-hmm. If you don't mind me asking, man, what kind of work did your father do? He was in sales, man. He was like a white okay. collar guy, always, always working hard for the family, you know, and often traveling, you know, 50, 60 hours a week kind of guy, always out there doing his thing and, and always working hard in the sales industry. Mm-hmm. Now, I see how that's a correlation to a lot of the tradesmen that we we have on the show that come on, you know, um, a lot of guys who work for home and stuff like that. Um, how did that affect the uh, how did that affect you? His, his absence It's more like he would be there in the evenings or on the weekends, you know? And so I think, I think fathers probably have a way of, you know, going out there and hitting the front lines and, and going out and, and, and there's probably like the separation between work life and, and, and personal life, you know? So I, I, th- I think, and, and, you know, there's just a lot of responsibility that comes with being a father. I think being emotionally available, being physically available, being spiritually available and trying to manage all the nuts and bolts of a family. So I wouldn't say my dad was absent, but I also felt like, you know, my dad was just, he had his hands full, you know, and I think he was, and it, with all love and respect, I think he was also doing his best, you know, so he was there, but uh, again, I feel like there may have been an absence in terms of just really maybe, maybe depth to the relationship, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. No, no. And I see that trend, you know, with fathers 
throughout the country, all these different fathers that I speak to and have on this podcast, you know, some of their fathers are really engaged and, and some of them had this, what I call the distant dad syndrome. And, um, it's cool to, to get that background on your relationship with your father, you know, and it kind of sets up this whole premise of this podcast and stuff like that. Um, letting our audience know that they're not the only ones that this has happened to them. You know what I mean? So I think that kind of breaks down those barriers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I asked you to come on this podcast for the simple reason that you have this amazing story about overcoming pornography and stuff like that and these addictions. Okay. So with that being said, how old were you when you were first exposed to pornography, bro? You know, I, I have these questions quite frequently. I have these conversations quite frequently and I'm asked that. And mm-hmm. I really, if I can pinpoint it, I think it was probably um, age 13, somewhere in there. I remember a couple of times, like I would catch a glimpse of it, but then like, you know, the guys out back in the clubhouse going through the penthouse magazines. I remember that, that time distinctly. And I think I was probably in middle school, right around age 13 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And how did that affect you when you first saw that? Was it like, this is crazy or, you know, this is crazy. This is exciting. You know, I think I remember like, like being younger, like a couple of my buddies had like playboys or something like that, or I'd see a poster in a garage somewhere or something like that. But then I, I remember distinctly like the first time seeing like hardcore porn, like in a play, in a penthouse or a hustler where there's like penetration going on. And that was like a whole, a whole other level. Um, yeah. I mean, it was exciting. It was arousing. It was whatever. It felt like bad and mischievous and all the stuff that sex and, and porn brings up for young kids, man. I, I would say it was like, it was exciting, man. Yeah. Oh, exactly. I, I, I remember uh, specifically when I was at, first exposed to pornography as well. Um, it was a penthouse magazine that was underneath my dad's bed. You know what I mean? And Mm. we had the habit of me, me and my younger brother, we'd crawl underneath the bed and, you know, we'd hide our toys and stuff like that. And I saw this magazine and my brother's like wondering why I didn't come out from underneath the bed. And he comes and joins me. He's like, what are you doing? And I, I showed him and, you know, we're looking at this stuff and, we both looked at each other like, oh, this makes us feel weird. You know, <laughs> we're little kids, you know? Yeah, brother. But uh, I wanted to ask you on our next question here is what were the factors that contributed to this addiction that you talked about overcoming with pornography? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good question, man. And, and, and again, it's like we're, we're trying to put we're trying to put our, our, our finger on things and pinpoint things that occurred so long ago. But as I retrace the steps and kind of look at, mm-hmm. you know, even as I grew into an adult, like what factors were contributing to my porn addiction? Mm-hmm. I think, I think one, I was a shy, awkward kid. I was shy around women. I was shy around girls. And I think in a way porn kind of, it bridged that gap for me in certain ways. It was a way for me to kind of explore my sexuality or meet some of those needs from the safety and comfort of not actually having to talk to regular girls. It like gave me a window into that world, you know, um, in, in, in the, in the mental world in the fantasy world that I wasn't experiencing in person. And also, so I think it was a way for me to, to meet some of those needs. I think it was a, a way for me to kind of maybe, uh, cope and, and, and meet certain needs emotionally. And also I think it was a way for me to explore my sexuality. Um, sex was always a big theme for me in my life and doing work around my sexuality has been a big theme for me. I grew up in the really uh, strict Pentecostal church. Um, So sex wasn't like a naughty word in my house, but it wasn't talked about a lot. And I had a lot of awkwardness around my sexuality. I didn't, I I really, as I like look back upon it, I didn't have a lot of room or, or space. I didn't feel a lot of comfort in exploring my sexuality or asking those questions or, or, or anything. It was kind of a weird subject for me. So I think, I think porn was also a way for me to kind of like to get to know, to explore and to better understand sex and, and, and my sexuality. Mm-hmm. How was it like, like in school, did you not have like uh, the, the typical um, class on pornography or, or like, uh, like masturbation or human re- reproduction and stuff like that? Did you guys ever have any of that kind of stuff? <laughs> to you you know man i think i I think i recall it maybe in high school Uh uh-huh but uh if anything man it was like a funny conversation right it was something that we all laughed at i think it was like in i think they tried to combine like gym class and phys ed all Mm -hmm. together with the sex conversation and 
Yeah. And, and like our teacher was kind of like a, like a macho kind of guy. So he was laughing. It was an awkward conversation for him too. I, I it seems like, like in retrospect, you know, so yeah, I, I don't think there was a great introduction mm-hmm. there. And I remember actually being a kid and my dad kind of bringing up the conversation mm-hmm. around sex and stuff like that in the car. And I remember like, again, man, I love my dad so much and I want to honor him in this conversation. And, but I remember that being like a really awkward conversation. I, it didn't, mm-hmm. it didn't, felt weird to me trying to have that conversation. I'm not sure he knew exactly how to navigate it either. And I think so much of, of I think a lot of our experience with sex and the conversation around sex um, in our youth comes from maybe the signals and conditioning mm-hmm. we received around religious upbringings oftentimes and sex being such a forbidden kind of naughty word, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why do you think that religion does that? I don't know, man. I don't know if it's like a... I, you know, I'm not sure if it's a means for control, mm-hmm. you know, control of others, control of the family, mm-hmm. um, control of like maybe not getting your like not not allowing your daughters to get pregnant or not, you know, like trying to stop your son from going out there and like, you know, getting getting a girl pregnant. So I don't know if it was like a means for control um, that maybe kind of morphed and kind of like in, into like this kind of unhealthy expression. But I think ultimately that's probably what it's about. Uh, I would I would say at, at, at its base, it's. Um, yeah, maybe taking some of these ideas and they've become distorted mm. and, and perceptions changed around them. And um, it's like, could be maybe like an unhealthy expression that some of these ideas are some control. But again, we're guessing at the answers of this, you know? Yeah, yeah. From my perspective, I think that religion has definitely kept this in the closet. You know what I mean? So it's been become one of those forbidden taboos. You know what I mean? Where it's the elephant in the room. And let's not talk about it. It's happening. People are getting pregnant. People are whatever, you know what I mean? And it's happening. And they chose to turn a blind eye to it. Now I see more in the religious groups now, right? Per se. Mm -hmm. Now they're starting to really focus and talk about sex and, and explain to people now how it is important. You know what I mean? How Mm -hmm. it is between a husband and a wife per se, or, you know what I mean? And how to explore each other and stuff like that and have this uh, relationship to be intimate with each other. Right. Yeah, I think so. And, 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 you know, as I reflect upon the question, I also think that maybe some of the original ideas around sex were presented because they were good ideas. You know, maybe it is good Mm -hmm. to be in a, in a, in a committed relationship before you're intimate or, or, or having Mm -hmm. intercourse with somebody, maybe that is like a general good idea, you know, because there's commitment there and you're going to have, a more a greater likelihood of both parents being involved in the relationship. But again, I think things become distorted and oftentimes maybe used for, for certain agendas potentially, you know? And I could see that. I, I respect that. And I could definitely see how that could happen. You know what I mean? Um, anytime we put our own perspective on something, you know, it's, it's the way we see it, right? <laughs> Not necessarily the way it is or the way you're going to receive it, but it's the way we see it. And yeah. a lot of times that's, that's the only thing that matters, you know, to us, you right. know what I mean? So, um, how is porn addictive, brother? I wanted to ask you, how do you feel that it becomes addictive when it becomes a problem? Mm-hmm. I think ultimately it becomes addictive because, uh, because we become reliant upon it to meet certain needs. And that's oftentimes, you know, our, our, our relationship with porn or food or cigarettes or drugs and alcohol, it's often like this unconscious thing. We don't often know why it is that we're going to the sex to the, maybe sometimes we go to porn because it's to meet a direct sexual need. We've got the sex energy and we we feel like we need to do something with it. We can't, we can't be with it. So we've got to, we've got to get rid of it. But a lot of times, you know, we've identified, we go to porn to meet other needs. We oftentimes we go to porn because we're feeling lonely. We're feeling angry, angry. We're feeling disconnected. We're feeling sad. Mm -hmm. We're feeling insignificant. You know, we're feeling anxious. We're feeling scared. And, you know, we're, we're using porn to meet certain needs, you know, and what I think we end up doing is we end up like hot, hardwiring almost this, this um, relationship in the brain. You know, we, we experience this physical sensation, we, we experience these emotions and we can't cope, you know, and so we end up going to porn or we go to the cigarettes or we go to the drugs in order to meet these emotions, you know, so we've got, we, we experience a thought or, or whatever in the brain. We experience it in the body as a physical sensation, as an urge, as an impulse, as an emotion. And we just have our go-to outlets. Again, for some people, it's food. For some people, it's a cigarette. I've had issues with both of those in my life along with porn. So oftentimes, we're just trying to deal with ourselves, 
Mm -hmm. We're trying to deal with our emotions. Um, and, and we're running away from, from pain and we're seeking pleasure. And that's what like, that's what like drives so much of us, you know? Mm, no, I'm glad that you said that. Cause that's, that's exactly the way I, I, I have always looked at it as myself is, uh, using porn as a means to cope, you know what I mean? And they could be food. It could be alcohol. It could be tobacco. It could be drugs, whatever, you know what I mean? It just, whatever gets you to be numb. I call it numbing, right. From yeah, that pain, bro. pain or trauma. You know, the thing about porn, though, is after you have that release, there's a certain shame, a certain emptiness that is followed mm -hmm. by that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that becomes a vicious cycle. It does, brother. And, and that's that's a really important piece. And I think, again, a lot of times people are on, on unaware of unconscious stuff. So we're feeling low. We're feeling energetic and energetically depleted. We're feeling emotionally low. We're feeling sad or whatever. So we go for that low hanging fruit. We go for the dopamine hit. We go for whatever it is. We go for the porn. We have this period of ecstasy and we get the high that we experience for however long that we're, we're engaged in it. But then afterward, we're just left depleted. We're left in the dumps. That shame was never resolved. That guilt, that low energy was never resolved. In fact, it's been fed and it's got this, as you, as you say, this really vicious, unhealthy um, loop that, that continues, which we have to intentionally snap out of and break, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So is it safe to say that people who are addicted to porn, right? they all have in common this, this, uh, something that they're trying to get away with, right. Or, or get away from this, this internal pain is because I'm trying to find a, uh, a correlation to, to all the people that have addictions with this. Like, what do they all have in common? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, if, if I were to guess, you know, yeah. if I were to guess, um, I think a lot of people are lacking. Well, just to touch on that point and to mm -hmm. your, to your point there specifically lacking awareness, you know, mm -hmm. they're lacking awareness. They're lacking. Like what is actually driving this behavior when I'm standing in front of the refrigerator, again, just to use uh, a term that maybe a lot of us can relate to. When I'm standing in front of the refrigerator at 12 o'clock at night. I'm not hungry, but I'm just here looking for something. I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'm, I'm looking for something, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think what a lot of addicts, um, lack is is awareness around the needs that they're actually attempting to meet and how to meet those needs in a healthier way they're unaware of of the of the emotions and really what's going on underneath the surface that's that's driving the behavior and what i found is once we be, can begin to almost illuminate that and turn the lights on and begin to see oh i had a difficult day at work or oh i'm actually really energetically depleted right now or i i was in a, i had gotten to a fight with my spouse or my kids and, and um, I'm now I'm feeling triggered to, to go to pornography. I think, I think awareness is a big piece of the puzzle. And once we can begin to see it, we can begin to make new and healthier choices. I think, I think what, what people also oftentimes lack is a sense of purpose. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm going to say no to the porn, what am I saying? Use, uh, what am I saying yes to? We've identified that, you know, porn, and I can speak to my own journey adversely and negatively affects every key area of our life. It affects our relationships, our mental health, our spiritual health, our physical health. It affects us at work. It affects our productivity. It affects all these areas. So it's really crucial that we get clear. If we can get clear on the ways that porn is affecting these areas, it's really, really important that we also get clear on, okay, what do I want to experience instead? So if I'm going to say no to the porn, what am I saying yes to? And what, what's a healthy redirection of that energy? So I think purpose and, and like a bigger why, a bigger vision is also Mm -hmm. really, really crucial. I find a lot of porn addicts, myself included, you know, lack or lacked vision yes. for their life, you know, lacked a, lacked a why, you know, big piece of the puzzle, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm glad you touched on that because I think that's even, that's something that we talk about here at our foundation, you know, not having that purpose, not having that why a lot of fathers know that they have to provide and they think that that's where it stops. You know, they, and you know, that even is on our slogan more than just a paycheck, you know what right. I mean? And having mm -hmm. that self-awareness to know that, Hey, you have an inner man purpose. You have this purpose to raise the next generation, you know yes. what I mean? And mentor and be there and, and protect and provide and, and just love on your children. Be that, that, that moral compass per se. Um, going back to what I was saying though, with pornography, it is about self-awareness, right? And I can mm -hmm. tie that into like what you said, when you come home, you're tired, you're fighting with your spouse, whatever, you know, you could either turn to pornography or you can turn to 
having a short temper and start yelling at your kids like I used to, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's having that self-awareness and being able to look in the mirror and be like, okay, why did you do that? Why, why are you doing this? Why are you having these destructive patterns? And it's good to be, be aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. It is, man. It, it, it's crucial. It's a crucial to change anything. We have to, we have to learn to be able to slow down enough to look underneath the surface a little bit. Cause oftentimes we're just in reaction mode all the time. You know, that's why mindfulness is such a big piece of our process. You know? mm. Now with this type of addiction, you talked about how it affected different, different things in your life. You know what I mean? Relationships, jobs, stuff like that. How have you seen it affect relationships as far as with your spouse or your significant other mm-hmm. or your children and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, porn, porn is one of those things. I think it is a path, man. You mentioned earlier at the beginning of our conversation, the path, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and so porn was most present um, in my life Mm -hmm. while I was in a relationship several years ago. And I was in a relationship with a great girl, man. Um, But I was also really at the height of my porn addiction, I would say, you know, Mm -hmm. a couple years in that period. And, um, you know, and it's really interesting, man, because a lot of guys go to porn. They say, well, I'm not getting the intimacy I want in my relationship. Mm-hmm. So I have to go to porn to deal with those certain needs. But what they often don't recognize or aren't willing to admit or accept is that it's the relationship with porn that often fuels the lack of intimacy in the relationship or contributes to, mm-hmm. you know. So for whatever reason, I had this I was in this relationship with this great girl. And whether it was just lack of intimacy because we weren't a great match romantically or sexually, or maybe it was lack of intimacy because of where I was sexually in my relationship with porn. You know, there wasn't a lot of, of, of sexual intimacy going on. Um, So for me, um, I found that, you know, I was, I was going to the, I was going to porn maybe during the day or something like that, whenever she wasn't home and then she would get home or we would be hanging out later that, that week or later that night or whatever. And, and the time would come around for us to be intimate, but I wouldn't have the interest, you know? Um, so I found a direct correlation. I mean, I, I think the most obvious correlation is we're expending our energy on porn over here, and then we don't have the energy for, for our partner. So that would be the most immediate and direct um, thing. But I, I think also porn also has a way, at least for me, and maybe you can relate to this, of making me feel kind of awkward, like not really comfortable in my own skin, uh, 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 at least for a period until I'm able to get a couple days or a couple weeks of abstinence under my belt. So it would be like, I would feel a social awkwardness. I would feel a sexual awkwardness. So whenever it would come time to engage with my partner, I wouldn't, I would just, I was feeling kind of like sexually off oftentimes. And I, maybe I wouldn't be interested for that reason, you know? So mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> and maybe just generally, because I find for me that porn is really unhealthy. It kind of has this toxic effect would throw me off energetically and the relationship would just be off, man. So we could look at the direct effects such as saying I masturbated today and now I'm not really, I don't really feel that drive to have sex with my partner this evening. Or we could look at the more subtle things. I'm off energetically. I'm off spiritually. I'm off sexually. And either that's my experience or that's something that she picks up on. And and there's Mm -hmm. something not in alignment within the relationship. That'd be my guess. Yeah. No, and I could see that happening too. You know what I mean? There is going to definitely be that disconnect that you're feeling, you know what I mean? Where you guys are no longer in sync, you know, and no longer in sync. When you talked about energy, um, I'm a lineman by trade. So I definitely know about energy and stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. when I was battling with the addiction of pornography, it started really young for me as well. And hindsight 2020, looking back, I see all these different energy leaks, you know what I mean? To where, it, it it started to be one of the things that I wanted. I looked forward to, you know what I mean? And then it became this deal to where women started being looked as an object. Yeah. In my eyes, you know what I mean? Now mm-hmm. it's, it's becoming this point to where we're trying, I, well, you know, for me, I was trying to do the same things I was seeing on television, you know what I mean? And that is completely yep. unhealthy, especially now being a, a father to a teenage daughter, it's like, whoa, you know what I mean? That's that's someone's little girl. So that's a Amen. real eye opener, eye opener for me. You know what I mean? Um, one of the things I've seen is that porn definitely has the ability to turn sex right into masturbation. And it, when it mm. becomes that, it's no longer relational. And now it's from a self-serving place. You know what I mean? So it's very it, 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 it you're self-serving yourself, basically, is what I'm saying. 
Yeah, brother, I get you 100%. It makes it's a very selfish act. It's about you getting off. I heard uh, one of my mentors one time, he said that, um, you know, it, like sex can become vaginal masturbation, you know, and that's really all it's about, man, lacking mm. connection, lacking presence, lacking true intimacy, lacking that that beautiful exchange that can that can occur, you know, um, yeah, hundred percent, man. It really, porn ha- uh, has this way of causing us to objectify and sexualize mm. women, as you as you say. And, and there's also this piece of it. It's like, I feel like porn has a way of almost traumatizing us as young kids. Like maybe when we're thirteen or fourteen years old, that mm. is kind of how we see women. We do see women as like this object of our lust, you know. And and I think a lot of guys because they they maintain this relationship with porn, it's like many guys are still those little boys Mm -hmm. deep down inside. You're still, you know, maybe a 30 or 40 year old man is still that 13, 14 year old boy, you know, deep down inside, still looking at women as this object to, to get off to, you know? So I think a lot of our work is, is going back and, and helping that little boy grow up and and see through, through new eyes, you know? Mm, No, I I like the way I like that perspective. Um, Speaking of eyes, for me, I've, I've noticed, and I've talked to other men who have dealt with this before in the past, there's certain things that you cannot unsee. I mean, there's stuff that I remember seeing 20 years ago when I was in the military. And I remember specifically watching this one porn. All of us were gathered. It was, uh, we were in uh, this one building. You know, we were kind of left to ourselves. You know, there's like 20 of us in the room. And that's how we used to pass our room inspections. Depending on the instructor, this is back with VHSs we're in, you know what I mean? So we put the little yellow stickies, you know, of like, say, for instance, the instructor liked uh, Asian girls or whatever. We would put that video in there and we put play me. And that's how we passed our room inspections. You know what I mean? But uh, anyhow, long story short, we're in this room. We're all gathered there. And there is two brothers that were identical twins that were in my class. And they catch us watching this hardcore I mean, in fact, I think that's what it's called. It's called Max Hardcore. It was this awful, mm-hmm. awful, awful porn, right? And I mean, it was abusive, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, we're all watching it. You know, I'm an 18-year-old kid. I'm in there with, with guys that are 24, 25, 26, you know, and we're all watching this crap. And uh, these two identical twin brothers, they're from Hawaii. They come in and they're like, bro, what are you guys watching? Do you realize that's some girl's, that's some guy's daughter? And that's all they said. And then they left and everybody just got real quiet. And then all of a sudden, everybody just started walking out of the room one by one. Like, I got to go. You know what I mean? It was that shame that was built up of knowing that, hey, what the heck are we watching? (laughs) You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm not sure how much we'll get into it in today's conversation, uh, David. But that's also what I see as a a big problem for the the youth out there today. Mm -hmm. You know, um, everybody's got this phone in their hand. Yep. with access to the most extreme, most graphic, most explicit stuff. And there are lifetimes and lifetimes worth of porn out there to consume. And these kids are getting it into their hands, like at younger and younger ages, man. And I think it's, well, actually, I know it's it's really, uh, I think, influencing their perception of sex and also their expectation of, of, of women, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, so it's, it's really, really unhealthy, man. Now, now that we're talking about that topic about how, we have this freedom, right, from our phones and, you know, all this this age where, you know, the culture is starting to sexualize advertising of, of women and stuff like that. How can one get over that? How can one in this age put up these safeguards so they don't have to fall into that, you know, especially if they're addicted to this? You know what I mean? What do you suggest? Oh, so are you asking how does someone, can you, can you, can you, can you say that question again, brother, just so I make sure I understand? Like what are kind of, you know, we just talked about how there is, you know, on social media and everything out like that. And porn's real, real easy to get to nowadays, especially with our phones. How can Mm -hmm. one set up safeguards? Okay. Yeah. uh, Yeah, for sure, brother. And, and it is really, it takes real intention, man. That's again, mm-hmm. where vision, that's where purpose, that's where why comes in. You have to have a strong motivator because if you're on social media today, it is everywhere you look. It's in advertising, it's in marketing, it's in the girls. Even if it's a girl who's just doing the, hey, I'm a liberated uh, woman thing and she's putting, she wants to put her, I'm, I'm a female in power and she puts provocative, sexy stuff up just because that's her right to do. I mean, everything 
is, mm -hmm. is triggering on social media out there, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or like TikTok, whatever, man. So mm -hmm. sex sells. So we have to, first of all, be really, really intention, uh, intentional about this. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to really tap into what's my why, man? What's, what's the reason? What's the driver? What's the motivation behind this? Because that's got to fuel everything else. And so, so the guys that come into our program and our process, you know, they're the ones that show up and they say, all right, I'm going to put my money down and I'm, I'm ready for this change in my life because at this trajectory, you know, like it's, it's just not going anywhere good. It's only going to get worse and more destructive. So we've got to have a really powerful why, man. That's the first thing. And then after that, it really comes down to integrity because mm -hmm. like if the alcoholic wants his alcohol, he's going to get it, you know, no matter yeah. what safeguards are in place, you know. Even guys in prison are able to get their hands on this kind of stuff or, or you know, alcohol, you know? So it's like, what, whatever it is, you can get your hands on it, but you've got to have a powerful why. You have to have integrity. And, and you know, like in, in our program, in our process, we have this whole, we have this whole exercise. It's called clean up the field. Mm -hmm. And we start there and we go through the social media accounts and we go through the Instagram, we go through the Facebook, we go through the hard drive and we get rid of all the stuff in our environment. If there's that girl that really doesn't contribute anything to your newsfeed, but she's always posting the provocative stuff, we got to get rid of it. We got to get out of the chats where the guys are exchanging porn back and forth or out of the email groups or whatever it is. We have to be really digital. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to be really intentional mm -hmm. about cleaning up the field. That's what we call it. And really scouring our environment to remove as many triggers as possible. But even with that, you know, and maybe it's like, I don't even get on social media anymore at all anyway. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it's like that extreme because it is really triggering. Um, so we have to go through that process. After that, man, it comes down to a, a matter of integrity and a matter of decision because mm -hmm. that stuff's still going to pop up. And we've got this, this concept, we call it the guardian at the gate. We have to be noble because and we have this rule we call it the two by two rule. Like if mm -hmm. you see something, you know if it's triggering or not, you've got to turn your attention away from it, man. You can't let yourself start going down that path mm -hmm. because you've got to you've got to maintain a high level mm -hmm. of integrity. You've got to have the guardian at the gate so we don't start entertaining fantasy. Because once we do, once we start going down the path, man, it's really slippery slope. So we've got to always be on guard, always be vigilant and, and mm -hmm. kind of guard. It's like whenever I was a kid, man, you know, the church gave me such good, good foundational stuff and there was this song that says be careful little eyes what you see you know yeah. and what goes in comes out man so we've got to learn to guard what's going in mm -hmm. um so you know these are all pieces of the puzzle that are that are really important and then kind of our final kind of some of the capstone of the work that we do is we have this exercise called the noble lens and i think ultimately it's about learning to evolve our perception and our consciousness to learn to like hey when i see that that girl yeah she's beautiful but I recognize that she also is someone's daughter. She is someone's mother. She is someone's little girl, you know, mm -hmm. and, and she's also a divine being. And however you want to put it, she's a child of God, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we can learn to evolve the way in which we, we view things. She's not just a, a sex object. And, and all that awareness mm -hmm. kind of helps us make those decisions. But it comes down to decision and it comes down to integrity and it comes down to intentionality, brother, at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Long answer. <laughs> Yeah, no, and that's perfect, you know, because it does, it comes down to our choice because we all have certain freedoms, you know what I mean? We, you know, I hate when people say, oh, um, I'm addicted to this. I'm just, yeah, you're addicted to it. But at the end of the day, you still have a choice. Do you choose to do yeah, that man. or not? You know, absolutely. Um, with that being said, you know, I like that you talked about how this whole concept, right? Sex sells, right? To me, it's a deeper issue, you know, to me, it's, a deeper issue to where these girls are not being accepted at home. You know, I mean, these girls that are on there, you know, to where social media portrays these young women to, you know, flaunt themselves. I mean, we see it all over the place, you know, Instagram, whatever, you know, they're, they're showing their stuff and, you know, they have this little coffee cup and say, look at my coffee cup. But then you're they're showing a bunch of cleavage and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And it's like, really, you know, you, why are yeah, you, brother. why do you have to feel that you have to do that stuff to get attention? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, go ahead. Yeah, man. And, and, and I don't want to say this. I mean, yeah, it's attention at home, which is where this this idea that I'll share really has to originate, I think, or it can mm -hmm. originate. But I think it also comes down to self-acceptance and self-worth, yeah. you know? You know, like if maybe, maybe you've never maybe you never received that that acknowledgement and that recognition and that affirmation from your from your family. But at the end of the day, 
you know, we've got to recognize that it's not a comparison game and our worth or our value does not come from how many likes we receive um, on, on, on Instagram or Facebook, man. It's, it's got to be much deeper. And that's like, it really ties into our work as well, man. So much, so much of our work is about self-love and self-acceptance, man, not needing external validation, um, mm -hmm. you know, from, from somewhere else to fill that void, man. It really has to come, comes down to self-acceptance, I think as well, David. I know I agree with you 100%. And that's what I tell our fathers too, is like, hey, man, show your daughter that, you know, accept your daughter. Because if not, if you don't accept your daughter, guess what? She's going to be going and trying to find yeah. acceptance from a young boy somewhere. And you might not like that outcome. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, man. 100%. Now, what do you think this message, this, this whole deal with pornography what kind of message do you think it's sending to young men and women right now as far mm -hmm. as our culture and stuff like that? Yeah, man. I think I think it's um it's sending the message of instant gratification. Mm -hmm. It's 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 sending the message, you know, like the easy road, you know, grow for the low-hanging fruit, go for the easy means of satisfaction. I think it's really sending the message like this skewed um, image and perception and idea of what sex is, of what healthy connection is of what love is. I think it's skewing the, the expectations, like what a woman is supposed to look like, how a man is supposed to, I really use this term lightly, but I'll just use it for the sake of the conversation, perform in the bedroom, mm -hmm. what he's supposed to look like, how he's supposed to show up, how he's supposed to act. Um, and, and I think it skews the perception of, of how women are supposed to, um, to, to show up and, and what, and what love really looks like, man. It's like, I think it, I think it sends that message. You know, we uh, we have this idea that says something like, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of men mistake sex for intimacy. You know, mm -hmm. and 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 that's that's not. I mean, there, you know, sex can be and often is very beautiful and intimate, but sex is not intimacy. There, there, there are two separate things, man. You mm -hmm. know, so I think I think that's the that's a lot of what these messages that are being sent, brother. No, and I agree with you. Um one of the things we talk about intimacy, you know, with uh, other couples is intimacy is what intimacy means in to me, see being completely transparent with your spouse and being able to share, you know, things that you wouldn't want to share with anybody else. You know, that's intimacy, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I, and I, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right through the media and through everything else. We have mistaken that, hardcore pounding and sex and all that stuff that's intimacy you know that that's connection you know what i mean right and right so far from the truth you know what i mean it, it's been skewed over time but uh with that being said dude i wanted to read you something that i i had read and i, I thought it was pretty 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 crazy i was reading on this one talking point where it said that men and women who were exposed to large amounts of pornography were significantly less likely to want daughters rather than sons. That's how much of an impact porn has on people. Wow, man. Interesting. Very interesting. No, nah, and I mean, it, it's, I mean, to think about it now, you know, just having a daughter, it's like, absolutely, you know, after even partaking in, in, in pornography, you know, at a young age and stuff like that and through the military and stuff, I see why people would be like, dude, I don't want to have a girl. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know man. what I mean? Because, mm -hmm the whole culture has changed to where we are objectifying these women where we're, we're degrading them, you know, um, it ain't no different than the violent video imagery that is being showed on video games. You know I mean? There's a direct correlation there when you have these graphic pornographies where these, these women are borderline abused. Right. And yes. then we see that. And then through neuroplasticity, we're creating these neural pathways that carve this right. groove into our brain. Right. To yep. where it just continues to widen it to where we no longer having a feeling towards that, that woman. We don't see her as a woman or someone's mm -hmm. daughter. Now they have been leveled out to where it's just an object and I'm going to use that object. Exactly, man. Exactly. And, and because of this, you know, it, because of the neuroplasticity and because, you know, the, you know, porn very much acts like a drug on the brain, you know? So it's like, we need more and more and more. We need more extreme stuff and more extreme content mm -hmm. in order to hit those, uh, in order to arouse us and hit those arousal mechanisms, man. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a slippery slope, man. Mm -hmm. The question is, where does that stop though? Yeah. 
you like like where does the graphic stuff stop like yeah like genre stop or what like where does it stop to where we, when we're we can't get our fix every time we got to watch something worse and worse and worse to to fulfill that yeah. dopamine right where does it finally stop Bro, it stops with you. Mm-hmm. It stops with you, man. It, it stops with me. It stops with with me several years ago recognizing it's like, all right, I recognize that the genres I'm watching are more and more extreme, more mm-hmm. and more scandalous, you know? And it's like this then and so I, I noticed that trend. Mm-hmm. And I also noticed the trend of me getting older and not being able to control this habit. And I'm like, I don't want to be a 70 year old man by myself. You know what I mean? With my with my penis in my hand, watching some weird stuff on the screen, you know, like 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 what kind of life is that, man? So I kind of recognize like the, the trajectory of, of of where it goes because I don't think it does stop, man. Like that's what suffering is. That's what these dark holes are. It's it's like more and more and more, and and it's a real trap, man, because it's all out there. You can mm-hmm. get as extreme and violent and weird and taboo and go all these different directions um as as you want man so what we see also with with a lot of guys is guys getting into male male stuff and just like taking it more and more extreme and not not that there's anything wrong with that if that's someone's bad but a lot of times these guys are going into these extreme genres Mm -hmm. and it's like they're in it and it it's turning them on and they're aroused by it and they're masturbating to it but when they come back out of it they're like man what did i just see what did i just watch that's not Mm -hmm. what i want for myself or that's not how i really want to treat somebody but but um, yeah, so it's 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 a it's a dark abyss, man. So it's got to go. It's got to be uh, the, the buck's got to stop with you, brother, and the buck's got to stop with me. You know. So mm-hmm. that's that's my message. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, it's all about that self awareness. You know, seeing where you're going in your path and being able to be like, hey, man, I don't like this person I'm becoming. Right. Where does this go in twenty years? You know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What's what's the light at the end of the tunnel here? You know, or what's the big yeah, picture? Bro. You know, that's yeah. that that's one of the things that we we always tell our apprentices. You know, at, at our apprenticeship is like, I'll try to step back and see the big picture. You know what I mean? And, and for this, that's the same thing. You know what I mean? Try to step back and see the big picture. Have that vision, like you're talking about. You know. Yeah, man. And, and, that, and that, that was for me why I ended up like that's why I ended up saying, all right enough's enough. And I can't do this by myself. And I don't like where this is going. That's why I ended up breaking down and hiring a coach, man, and like investing in a coach and a community and a path and higher Mm -hmm. levels of accountability around this, because I I wasn't successful on my own and it wasn't getting any better, man. Mm -hmm. So that accountability though, that plays a big part. Um, Just having that partner that you can go to and be like, Hey, this is what I did again. I screwed up. (laughs) You it know? really does, man. It really does. They say accountability is the glue that ties the commitment to the result, you know, and that's where community comes into play. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, brother, thank you for coming on and sharing all your information that you have. I mean, it was a tremendous amount of information. I, I really hope this helps out our listeners. I know it will. Um, if anybody can get a hold of you, Matt, uh, I'd like for you to share it on here if you don't mind. And if they have questions yes. about addiction and stuff like that. Yeah, please. Uh, th- thanks so much for the opportunity, uh, David. So um, we are running right now a, uh, a Facebook group. That's where a lot of our activity is. It's called Porn to Purpose. If you're on Facebook, Porn to Purpose. It's a private men's only community. And really, that's one of the first steps, man, is getting into community, getting into accountability, and and start getting some, some training and, and some wisdom around this, man. Getting into community really kind of helps you see that you're not alone on this path. Mm-hmm. And it and allows you to begin kind of normalizing this conversation and getting supported. So I'd, I'd recommend checking us out on Facebook at Porn to Purpose. Um, it's a private men's only group. And if you're not on Facebook or you're not really kind of ready to go to a, to a public forum type setting, uh, you can email me directly at makingpeacewithporn at gmail.com. Once again, Matt, thank you for coming on here. And to our listeners, this is no way in any intent to try to shame you into anything like that. This is about growing better as a human being, as a husband, as a father, and for the legacy that you're going to leave. So once again, this is David with the show up that and you guys keep doing what you guys are doing. Keep being that dad. That's more than just a paycheck. Once again, thank you.